Good morning, Carson Bible Church. Please take your Bibles and turn to Malachi chapter 3. This morning we are working through verses 6 through 12. This is Malachi's fifth disputation between God and his people. I'm going to go ahead and pray and we will get started. Heavenly Father God, we humble ourselves before you. God, we recognize that you are God and we are not. Uh, we recognize that we are uh, part of your creation. We are subject to you, to your sovereignty, to your will. Uh, we have been rebellious. We are subject to corruption and sin. And in uh, so many ways, we have turned our backs on you, God. And we desperately are in need of a savior. Uh, and we understand that you alone have provided uh, the one and only Savior and Redeemer in the person of uh, Jesus Christ, your Son, the Jewish Messiah, the God-Man, and his work on the cross, his resurrection from the grave. Uh, it is in him alone that we have any grounds to approach you, that we uh, can even uh, appropriately pray to you, that we can worship you. Uh, it, it really is uh, in him alone that we can do that. We thank you so much for our salvation in Jesus. We thank you for his kingdom. Uh, we uh, look forward to his return. Uh, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the conviction of our sin. And uh, God, we, we pray this morning uh, as we work through this uh, often misused and misinterpreted text that uh, by the help uh, of your Holy Spirit, by the conviction of your Holy Spirit, uh, by the wisdom of your Holy Spirit, that we would be able to apply it rightly to our lives and uh, glorify you by doing so and uh, that we would be transformed by the truth of your word in this passage, God. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, before we get started in our text, I wanted to ask a quick question. How many of you guys remember Millie Vanilli? Millie Vanilli, of course, uh, pop, R&B, sort of Euro uh, duo in the late 80s. They uh, came out of nowhere. They then all of a sudden were everywhere. Their first single, uh, Girl You Know It's True, reached number two on the Billboard charts. They had three other songs that then reached number one on the Billboard charts. They had another single that reached number four on the Billboard charts. And this was all within the span of just about two years. They won American Music Awards. They won a Grammy. And then, of course, it all came crashing down. They uh, rose to fame. They were uh, in interviews on MTV and radio and, and other outlets. And uh, some people started to ask questions because in their songs, uh, they were sung in English uh, with no accents. And yet in interviews, when they spoke with the duo, one of them had a very heavy French accent. One of them had a very heavy German accent. And it was surprising that in their songs, they sung, sang without an accent at all. And then as people would start to ask them about the lyrics, then it came, became clear that there were actually some of the English lyrics in their own songs that they couldn't pronounce. And then finally, one day in 1989, it all came horribly crashing down before a crowd of 80,000 people. The backing track that they were performing to started to skip. And it became very clear that their microphones were not on. They were lip syncing the entire performance. And it wasn't so horrible at first. Actually, at that time, it was very common for uh, big name artists uh, to perform their large-scale concerts uh, either 
entirely with a backing track or maybe with a, a lower volume backing track because what audiences wanted at that time was a flawless performance that was just like the CDs and tapes that they had at home. They wanted uh, the, the visual performance, but they didn't want uh, the, the audio to suffer uh, because of, of the visuals that were going on. And so it was very common and, and it was expected for performers to have a backing track, especially a vocal track going on during these large scale concerts. But as the facade continued to crumble around Milli Vanilli, it then became clear that those two performers, Rob and Fab, had never even sung a single note in the live performances or in the recordings. It was all a complete lie. What had happened was that a music producer actually heard a song, Girl You Know It's True, uh, that was already written and performed by an American group, but uh, they were an unknown group and the song was being played in European clubs and it was a favorite of uh, European uh, club dancers and uh, he heard the song and he thought that he could do something better with it and make it a bigger worldwide hit. And so he stole the song and paid some uh, vocalists and musicians to re-record the song and he released it and it became huge. And then as it started to gather momentum, um, he needed to then have a face to go with that song. And so he found uh, two young men. They had aspirations of getting into the music business, but they really um, had nothing uh, at that point. He literally found them living in slums uh, and he paid them a certain amount of money to come be the face of this song. And uh, with uh, the help of uh, songwriters and uh, the musicians that they recorded that first single with, this music producer uh, continued to put together uh, songs. And uh, these, these two young men became the face of what was this group, uh, supposedly called Milli Vanilli, only it was all hidden, it was all done in secret. The, the music was recorded late at night uh, in the studio when, when nobody would see the real performers uh, coming in or out. Uh, the uh, Rob and Fab, who were the face of Millie Vanilli, were paid money to not say anything about it. Others were paid money to keep everything quiet, uh, but it could only be kept up for so long. Uh, the, the entire thing crumbled um, and it, to this day, is known as one of the biggest scandals to ever shape the music industry. And it's interesting, actually, because the songs aren't bad. Uh, if that's your style of music, even to this day, they're catchy, uh, they're singable, they're danceable, they're, they're decent songs, they're good jams, they're bops. And yet, when you hear those songs today, they probably don't bring a smile to your face. You feel cheated. And really, uh, this thing that was called Milli Vanilli, in a lot of ways, they cheated themselves out of what could have potentially been a legitimate music career. They cheated music fans by promoting a lie, and eventually they came to believe their own lie, actually. And it's actually very interesting to me because uh, you could make the argument that this thing called Milli Vanilli really gave this gift of a, a good number of good songs to the music world, and yet in reality, they cheated the music world by what they gave, and the reason is because what they gave was false. It was entirely hollow, empty. It was a facade. What was at stake was not a musical issue, 
It was a substance issue. And what God is going to confront his people on today with this passage is that they are actually robbing him, they are cheating him by the gifts that they are giving. Because it's not a dollar sign issue, it's a heart issue. So let's go to our passage, Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Now, uh, several weeks ago, when I told you guys that we were going to start working through Malachi, this is probably the passage that came to mind. This is probably the most uh, quoted, most used passage out of the book of Malachi, and it is also probably the most misused, mis quoted, misappropriated passage, maybe in all of Scripture. We're going to work through that. Um, we start in verse 6, which uh, some commentators actually group verse 6 with the previous passage. Um, it, it kind of makes sense as a, as a transitional phrase, as a transitional thought, where God says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Remember that the previous passage was that uh, the people were clamoring for God's justice and they were wondering, when will the wicked be punished? And uh, God here is uh, saying, uh, kind of in, in a transition from his uh, answer to that question, is that he remains the same and because God's attributes don't change, God is who he is, Therefore, they're not consumed. Remember, they were entirely unprepared for God's judgment. And if God had poured out all of his wrath on wickedness and sin, then all of them would have been consumed by it. And so the transition in thought here is that because God is a patient God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love because they are not consumed by his wrath and his judgment, his punishment on sin, it's going to lead us into the next thought here. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you is the Lord of hosts. Remember how the terminology that God uses in answering these questions and bringing up these indictments uh, recalls their memory back to different parts of their history. And just these couple of sentence here, sentences here I think are really profound. He calls them, O children of Jacob. And uh, that's accurate. Uh, that really brings us back to uh, the first discussion that uh, God had with his people in Malachi, uh, was that he uh, reminded them that they were the children of Jacob and not of Esau, and uh, that God promised that Jacob and his descendants uh, will not be overshadowed by Esau and his descendants. God has shown his love to them. 
because he has uh, established his covenant with them. And here he's actually playing on a different aspect of Jacob's character. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Jacob was a scoundrel. Jacob was a swindler and a cheat. And what God is saying is that you people are just like your father, Jacob. Your father, Jacob, was a scoundrel and a swindler and a cheat. And all of the rest of you have been scoundrels and swindlers and cheats ever since. You see what God is doing here. He's setting this principle up, which is, I, the Lord, do not change. I, the Lord, am holy and righteous and just, and I always have been and I always will be. And you, sinful humanity, do not change. You are scoundrels, you're swindlers, and you're cheats, and you continue to be. He says, therefore, return to me. You've turned aside from the statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. God has not abandoned them. He's not left them. He's not deserted them. But really, God is kind of building on the foundation that was set up in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessings and the cursings, which essentially come down to, if you are obedient to me as they go to occupy the land that was promised them, if you are obedient, then it will go well with you. And if you are disobedient, then it will not go well. And so God says, return to me. And they answer with this question, how shall we return? Remember, under Malachi, in their recent history, they had been in Babylonian Persian captivity for a period of approximately 70 years. Then, over a, a period of a few years and in several different waves, they return to the promised land. They return to their homeland of Israel. They were tasked with rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, all of the agricultural land had been laid waste over those uh, intervening years. They had a lot of work to do. And that's their question. How shall we return? Didn't we already return? Aren't we here? Haven't we done everything that you asked of us? Didn't we rebuild the temple? Didn't we rebuild the wall of Jerusalem? Haven't we reinstated a priesthood? Aren't we back to making sacrifices? What more do you want from us, God? The problem is that uh, it wasn't a geographical return. It wasn't a location that was the issue. Their hearts were far from God. God was calling them to return to him in their hearts. And here God answers their disputation. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, they again respond with the question, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. And I, I don't want us to, to miss this. Robbing involves taking something. And yet God says that they were robbing him 
by their tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings are things that are given. God says by what they are giving, they are robbing him. And I think that is going, just understanding that is going to help clarify for us what this passage is all about and will be a safeguard for us against misusing it. The problem was not dollar signs. The problem was their heart. They were robbing God of his reputation. They were robbing God of the glory due his name by what their gifts and offerings said about what they believe about him. So we have three points that we're going to make here this morning, three different ways in which God's people were cheating. The first starts here in verse 9 and goes through the first half of verse 10. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Remember previously God has made accusations against the priesthood and uh, how their actions, uh, how their uh, poor leadership was leading the nation into improper worship of God and they were falling into amoral living Here God uh, says the indictment is against the entire nation, the whole nation of you. He says, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Um, Let's understand what God means by the full tithe. Um, In the Old Testament, as we read through the laws of what it meant to bring offerings to the temple, to bring a tithe of, of what amount was supposed to be given over to God. The word tithe, of course, means 10%. And 10% was to be given over to God. 10% of uh, income, 10% of harvest, 10% of livestock, 10% of what a person is earning to sustain themselves. There were, however, multiple types of tithes. And on top of those tithes, there were to be free will offerings or goodwill offerings. And so if we were to actually start doing math in uh, our Old Testament texts, when someone is to comply with all of the tithes and offerings, it comes out to much more than 10%. It comes out to more like 30%. And what was the whole point of giving tithes and offerings? Remember that the Levites, the priests, were to make their living by working in the temple. And these offerings were to go to the temple, and there were uh, storage rooms in the temple that were called storehouses for grain offerings and things like that. Um, There were monetary offerings that were given to the temple as well. Um, Part of the sacrifice, uh, the sacrificial system, was for uh, the priests, Levites, to be able to have meat for them to, to eat. The whole idea is that by the offerings and tithes and sacrifices that the people bring to the temple and offer to God is that the priests and Levites working in the temple to facilitate and administrate the people's worship of God, they can be provided for through those offerings. It's also uh, every third year, I believe, uh, 
um, offer the, the tithes and offerings were taken uh, in, in the temple and they were used to provide for the poor and the needy, the widows and the orphans. And so the principle that was supposed to be at work was that God's people are generous in their worship of God and their offerings so that the people who have dedicated their lives to teaching God's word, facilitating and administrating worship of God, instruction, can be provided for. Those who are needy in the community can have their needs met through the worship of God. What was happening in Malachi's day is that as the people returned to the land, their agricultural uh, fields had been laid to waste, so it took a lot of work to get that rehabilitated to be uh, producing again. They are still under the thumb of Persia and have to uh, pay tribute to Persia and their governor. They're still surrounded by hostile people who don't want them to be successful in their land. They're facing a number of hardships. We're going to learn in, in a minute or two that they are also facing the issues of plagues and issues of drought. And so that means that their harvest is not as plentiful as they would want it to be. And so it seems that what they're doing is as they are encountering this economic hardship, they're bringing God less and less. And we know from Nehemiah that actually what ends up happening is that a number of the priests and Levites can no longer sustain themselves working in the temple alone. And they leave the priesthood to go back to their families, to go back to their uh, homesteads and their family farms. And, and they work their own land to be able to provide for themselves and their families because working in the temple just didn't make ends meet for them. And God is saying, this is not the way it's supposed to be. By offering, um, they, they've already been indicted for offering inferior animals as sacrifices. And God actually confronted them and said, why don't you try giving what you give me to your governor and see if he accepts it, and yet you expect me to accept it as worship. What they were offering to God says a lot about what they believe about God. They didn't believe God to be worthy of their very best. And God here is, again, revealing their heart. They didn't believe God to be worthy of giving a significant portion of their finances, their harvest, their livestock. They're robbing God of the glory due his name by offering less than what he was due. Here's, well, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. God says in the second half of verse 10, he says, Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Not only were they cheating God by giving him less and less as they continued to encounter hardship, they were cheating themselves 
God's promise here is that if they are obedient to the principles that he has laid out for them, then they will be successful. By cheating God, they were cheating themselves. God says, thereby put me to the test. Look, God doesn't often invite himself to be tested. There's only a handful of times in all of Scripture where God uh, puts up with being tested and where he actually invites himself to be tested. Here's one of them, and we do well to pay attention. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So actually, God's invitation is not to put him to the test. God's invitation is for them to live as if the promises that he's already made to them were real and as if they believe that God makes good on his promises. Bring the full tithe and see if I don't make good on my promises. And what he says here is that there may be food in my house and thereby, oh sorry, put me to the test uh, to see if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. This is very often misused. For Malachi and his audience, what would it mean for God to open the windows of heaven and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need? It means rain. They were experiencing drought. And because they were experiencing drought, their crops didn't produce. And because their crops didn't produce, they needed to keep everything they had, or a, a greater portion of what they had, to have to live on. And so they gave God a smaller and smaller and smaller portion. And God said, if you abide by the principles that I have laid out for you, just watch and see. And I will make it rain on your agricultural fields, and they will produce. In verse 11, he says, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, the devourer is probably some type of insect, some type of plague, on top of a drought that was destroying their crops. In times of economic hardship, often our first reaction is to look at where we can cut back in our budget. And for a lot of us, the first place that we look is our offering to church. And God says that that's the last place you should look. The principle that's at work is that we recognize that ultimately it's God who provides for us. All of our provision comes from God. And if our crops don't produce a big harvest that year. We don't take out of God's portion to continue to provide for ourselves. We give God his portion and we trust God to provide for us. If we're having a year of economic hardship, we don't start writing a smaller number on our offering check because we have to keep what we do have to provide for ourselves. We continue to give God what we have purposed in our heart to give, and we trust God to provide for us. Our offerings say a lot about what we believe about God. And that really brings us to the last verse here, verse 12. Then all nations will call you blessed, blessed, 
for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. They were cheating God. Ultimately, they were cheating themselves. And then finally, they were cheating the nations. Remember, Israel was intended to be God's chosen nation, a nation of priests who would display the creator God of the universe to the rest of the world who didn't know him. And by them not trusting God to provide for them, by hoarding the little that they had, what their testimony to the nations was is that our God cannot provide for us and we must provide for ourselves. And of course, that causes the nations to mock Israel. You see the, the term used in the Old Testament, they become a byword. And God says, that, that wasn't the intent. The intent was for Israel to live in such a way that displays God to the nations. A powerful, providing God. A holy and just, righteous God. A God who makes and keeps covenants. An idea is to draw them away from their pagan gods that are no gods at all and invite them into the kingdom of God. God says, Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight. By cheating God and cheating themselves, they ultimately are cheating the nations by essentially slandering God's name. They make God out to be a God who can't be trusted, a God who is uh, not powerful, a God who is not present with his people. This passage is very, uh, it's very applicable for us today in a number of ways. Think about, there are two huge problems that the church has with money. Uh, this passage really helps us clarify and we understand it well. Uh, of course, one is that accusation from outside of the church, right, where Critics of the church would say, all they want is your money, right? Pastors and preachers, they're just getting rich off of guilting congregants into handing over their money. The second is there are those who call themselves preachers and spiritual leaders who are after your money. And they will say, I'm rich, and if you just give the full tithe, then God will make you rich too. And God will open the windows of heaven and flood you with blessings. And if he's not, then that means you're not giving enough. So just write me a bigger check, and then God will bless you. And this passage really shows us that neither one of those are appropriate. Here when he's talking about the full tithe, he's talking about very specific regulations in the Old Testament. When he's talking about the, the opening the floodgates of heaven, he's talking about rain for their crops. This is not a passage about gaining wealth for anybody. 
This is a passage about what our offerings say about what we believe about God. Do our offerings say that we believe that God can provide for us? Because we have to ask the question, what does this mean for us today, and how do we apply it? What is the New Testament principle on giving? Uh, Paul describes it at length in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. New Testament giving is not a 10% that belongs to God. New Testament giving is grace giving. And grace giving understands what belongs to God is not just a 10% off the top. What belongs to God is 100% of everything. In grace giving, it says that we give what we have purposed in our heart cheerfully to give. To really uh, challenge you guys in, in a radical way, uh, Paul's understanding of giving and generosity in the New Testament, uh, also similar to Old Testament giving, he doesn't see widows, orphans, the needy, the impoverished, dependent on the state. He sees them as being dependent on the church. Paul has a vision of grace giving where God's people are so generous that they can provide for the needs of the widows, the orphans, and the impoverished. The New Testament principle of grace giving, and I know this sounds weird because I'm the guy saying it from the pulpit, but maybe some of you guys who are watching online, you might go to different churches. Maybe one day you find yourself at a church other than Carson Bible Church. The New Testament principle of grace giving is that those who have dedicated their lives to providing spiritual blessings to God's people are worthy of financial compensation. In the early church, what that looked like was as people met in homes, uh, one person who uh, was a leader in, in the congregation would actually stop working. They would leave their career field for a period of time and dedicate themselves to teaching and preaching the word. And because they were not generating that regular outside income, the church, the congregation, would provide for that income that they had lost, and then they would rotate, and another person who was a leader in that congregation would take some time off of their regular job, and they would dedicate themselves to the preaching and teaching of God's word. And so the congregation's offerings would go to make up for that lost income. The idea is that we shouldn't be starving our pastors and our preachers. When it comes to the congregation determining, or church leaders determining their budget, it's best when determining your preacher's salary to err on the side of generosity. Our pastors and preachers shouldn't be struggling. Like the Levites who had to leave their service in the temple in order to be able to provide for their families. Our pastors and preachers shouldn't have to do that. When it comes to our testimony around the world, we are still called 
to display God to the world. The Great Commission is for us to exalt the name of Christ. We are to be inviting people into a greater kingdom. Let's not starve our missionaries around the world. Let's have a testimony around the world of being generous, of understanding that all things belong to the Lord. And as God has been generous to us, we respond generously as well. Let's be the kind of people who don't rob God of the glory due his name by dealing with our finances foolishly or being stingy with our earnings. Let's not rob ourselves of relationship with God. By misappropriating our offerings. Let's not rob the world of the testimony of a glorious God who is deserving of all of our worship and worthy of all of our praise. The God who has created everything, who owns everything and is sovereign over everything, who deserves all that we have. Let's give generously to our missionaries around the world. They can be free to do the work of preaching and proclaiming the good news of the gospel. The exhortation here is that our offerings reveal our heart heart to what we believe about our Savior, Jesus, about our Creator, God, about the Holy Spirit who motivates our actions and our decision-making. Let's be radically generous. Let's provide for God's people. Let's provide for those who have dedicated their lives to the preaching and proclaiming of the gospel. Let's honor God with what we earn Jesus, you are a great Savior. You are a great provider. You've called us to trust in you as our provider. As you have been generous to us by giving your life on the cross in our place, may we also be willing to give up of our lives in order to entrust you to provide for us and care for us. God, we do lift up those who have dedicated their time and their efforts and their energy, who have maybe given up other livelihoods in order to pursue the preaching and teaching of your word. God, we thank you for them. And it is our prayer that your Holy Spirit would work in our hearts to be generous to them, to honor you with our giving. Those who have uh, left homes and gone around the world to preach your name where it may have not yet been heard. God, we want them to be well-funded and we want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of being a testimony of you and your greatness around the entire world. God, we pray that in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen.